So my name is Greg Gale. I'm the president of the board. I welcome you to tonight's August 22nd Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, we will uh, do a roll call first. Commissioner Doss? Here. Commissioner Coleman? Present. Commissioner Dale? Here. Commissioner Marks? Here. And Commissioner Higgins? Present. Brady, would you lead us in the pledge? to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, at this time in the agenda, we would take public comment uh, on items not on the agenda. Anybody wishing to speak on items not on the agenda? Now is your chance. All right, seeing that, we'll move on to consent calendar. We have no consent calendar, imagine that. Um, communications and reports. Mr. Director. So, well, first, the big news is we signed the uh, dredging contract with Future, Future Group. Um, and so uh, we're kind of in motion uh, in that. Um, we sent out a letter to the boat, the, basically the, the slips, and told them we need to start moving the boats, and we're getting all geared up for uh, this operation. Um, at the same time as we do that, we're asking people to call in, so we're updating the databases with new contact information and others, so we have our databases uh, up to date, and we're anticipating uh, starting in mid-November. Um, it looks like... Mid-September. Uh, Mid-September, I'm sorry. Mid <laughs> I apologize. And so... Um, the field's landing boat yard um, on the bottom right, uh, it looks like it will be approximately 2,000 cubic yards. Um, and those are the location in green is where we're doing that. We coordinated with uh, Todd Renke from Renke Marine um, and our staff to kind of figure out and kind of plot it out where everybody felt the best areas to dredge. Um, and the area that's near the shore, they said they don't bring the boats in that far. And if we need to, we could do that from the shore in the future and use the upland dewatering, and it would be a, a lot easier if they, everybody felt like the outside. Um, for Woodley Island Marina, um, we're going to start in the fairway between D and E and essentially work towards uh, the end tie on I, I dock, and go to the point where cumulatively between the fields landing and Woodley Island, we get to the 20,040 cubic yards, I believe, is the contract amount. Um, and so we have contracted with uh, Pacific Affiliates, and they are doing the both the pre, what's called the pre and the post dredging surveys. Even though we had the marina surveyed before, uh, the way the billing and everything is, you, <coughs> you do a survey of the elevations below the marina right before you dredge. And then you do another survey right at the end of the dredging, so you know how much uh, material is removed. And so Pacific Affiliates is, uh, is doing that. I believe they're scheduled to do it this week, is what I, I believe is the schedule. Um, and then I just wanted to really give you an update. We're actively working on doing fee re uh, revisions. It's one of the things in the budget that we were uh, looking at. And so in September, we're likely going to come back to you with uh, some increases in the harbor surcharge, establishing a field landing boatyard uh, dredge, uh, kind of a surcharge, um, uh, fees for like live aboard at the marina. We're considering doing like eliminating um, the electricity charges and potentially just raising the slip fees. In other words, having uh, across the board uh, for the slips um, and then increasing the permit fees to be deposits and to be directly reimbursable. And there's some other things. I really just wanted to give you the head, heads up that these are things that we're working on. Um, we released the RFP for the multi-purpose dock, and so I've, I've had uh, a couple of inquiries uh, of people, you know, you know, wanting copies of those and uh, actively interested in it. Um, I was also forwarded this. There's the Pacific Wind, off, the Pacific Rim Offshore Wind Conference in San Francisco between September 30th and October 1st. Uh, one of the people that contacted Commissioner Coleman and myself that we had toured before um, asked if we were going to this and to see if they could meet with us, you know, at the conference. Um, you know, it's kind of as the trick. We're in the RFP process, and so we have to be, you know, neutral with anybody that we meet with. 
And so, but um, we, uh, I want to have some uh, some discussions on, you know, it's good outreach for us to go to these conferences and stuff, especially right now when we have this RFP uh, out during this time period. So it's definitely something that we should consider doing. Um, with RMT2, we have a new tenant. Uh, they're moving in right now. Again, we have a coastal development permit. The process, we get new tenants. We send them to the county. The county signs off on them that they're approved tenants. And so uh, they're starting to move in uh, right now into 5,000 square feet uh, in, the, in the warehouse. Uh, Nordic Aqua Farms, they requested a due diligence uh, extension. Um, it wasn't a surprise at all. Um, that they requested an extension that's already included in the lease. Uh, we, the EPA uh, completed the brownfield uh, soil samples. In other words, we sampled all the soil in the top eight feet um, in the areas of concern. And this was coordinated with the US EPA, the Water Quality Control Board, and Nordics consultants. And so in addition to the samples that the EPA uh, and the water board wanted to see, Nordic took some additional samples beyond what they wanted. And because they were coordinating with Humboldt Baykeeper and some other organizations that they had some issues of concern. And so Nordic went above and beyond uh, and paid to have additional samples taken. Um, we got the lab results back from the EPA and the Water Quality Control Board and were pleasantly happy with the results. We don't have the final analysis yet of all the data, just really the raw data, but it came up good. It, everything came up good, and so that's really great news for, for the district and the community as a whole, that the, the soil um, doesn't appear to have a contamination um, that's of concern. Um, and so we also, within the last two weeks, uh, with Nordic and their consultants, we had pre-application meetings with the Water Quality Control Board, the Coastal Commission, the State Lands Commission, um, several different agencies essentially meeting with them and discussing what permitting issues might be and timelines. And so there's going to be a report that GHD is going to come out with that would outline the permit pathway uh, for all of those different agencies of how we would go through that. That will be happening in the, in the short term. Uh, we've also been meeting with uh, the county and the, the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District on turbidity reduction. And we started to look at the the clarifiers and other things, and so we're actively working on that. Um, in addition, uh, we're about ready to, because we got the permit, uh, coastal development permit, to use the sea chest to draw water out for the dredging. Then the consultations that we had with the Coastal Commission, now that we have that permit, we were going to reapply to be able to pull water out for other users besides just dredging, and that would enable us for like the sea salt and any of the other tenants that we want to have we'd be able to use the sea chest and market it to other people so they wouldn't have to go and get their own permits uh, to do that. Um, and we're also looking and doing an engineering review and the structural integrity of the RMT2 dock. Uh, there's already engineering reports. We're looking at those reports uh, of what would it take to bring ships uh, to come in on the dock to make sure that it's, it's sound and what repairs would be needed for ships and also the overhead conveyors. But um, out of curiosity, I'm sorry, uh, what type of business is Mountain Air? What's that? What uh, type of business is Mountain Air, the new tenant? Uh, they are, they're a compressed uh, oxygen. Uh, they have basically a big compressed oxygen tank that mm -hmm. they're putting in there. Uh, similar to the refined hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. It's not a coastal dependent industrial. It's an interim use mm -hmm. and went through the county review process. They replaced an existing tenant that we had in there that moved out. Okay, great. I was just curious. Um, I met with, uh, today, I met with uh, the government liaison for the California Public Utilities Commission and then discussed with him uh, the plans that we have for, number one, the fiber optic uh, project, and number two, the offshore wind uh, energy project, and was really kind of looking at those things of, uh, we, and this was brought to me by uh, a su supervisor, Virginia Bass, had re recommended that uh, he meet with us, and so we had a good couple hour meeting. I took him out to RMT2. He was he was really excited to see some of those information, and it was really good contacts. Um, with Shelter Cove, uh, one of the things that we had discussed with Shelter Cove was the possibility of having a, a government rate for their water and sewer uh, charges, and they're having uh, a meeting. They did a rate study, and they're having a meeting on August 15th to start talking about the rates. 
And so we might want to consider submitting a comment letter to them about the government fees. And specifically, we're talking about the fish cleaning station when we discharge into the fish cleaning station for the wash water uh, to make sure that it's affordable and that people, you know, it's really is a community benefit. And so we had talked to them before about the possibility of them doing a government rate, you know, for these community kind of infrastructure uh, projects. Um, we also met with uh, the Brookings Harbor staff came up here and we talked to them about how they operate the, the marina and, you know, how do you deal with dead boats, kind of their fee structure, a whole, whole host of things. We've been trying to meet with Crescent City, uh, Brookings, other ports and see how they're uh, operating and what are the things that we can, we can learn from them. And so it was really a good outreach. They learned some stuff from us and we learned a lot from them as well. Um, I'm going to the Harbor Masters Conference myself and uh, Cody Moores, who's the Marina Manager for the district. Uh, that's gonna be in Sacramento um, on the first week in September and there's gonna give a presentation on uh, aquaculture. We were asked to talk about some of the aquaculture things that we're doing on the port. And so I'm gonna give a presentation on that and it will really be the first opportunity uh, that uh, to go you know, for a conference and go before uh, other ports and sort of show what we're doing and you know how we're going about doing things. Um, that's all that I have. Uh, is Chris here? Okay, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. So as a facilities department and an overall team, the Harbor District team, all of us met or uh, assembled on the Port Authority boat the other day, uh, went out and did a tour of the, the uh, activities from uh, sponsored by um, MSRC and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and they deployed a buster. They did it from the end of Park Street on the sand and you can see the buster floating out there on the water and essentially that created a collection area if we had a spill on the water and it goes into a funnel and then they connect boats to the rear of it and um, uh, get the, uh, the spill off the water in that fashion. So it was a neat activity. It was great to be part of it. We had our, the bulk of our team there and uh, it was a nice activity for all of us. From a maintenance standpoint, um, I think Larry's already touched on that our marina manager is actively communicating with our tenants to be prepared for dredging. Um, we're also obtaining some estimates to install a sewer meter, and the purpose in that is our sewer rate is tied to our water usage. We're a high water user, uh, user so by uh, monitoring our sewer, we're able to get that cost down to the city, uh, what the city is currently charging us. Uh, we're headed out to Shelter Cove next week. Uh, one of our lead facilities persons and myself, and we're going to go to the site to see what kind of recurring maintenance may be necessary and start thinking about getting ready for fall and winter and some of the upcoming activities there. We also had got a panic call at the fish grinder now with tuna coming in isn't working, so we're going to be uh, replacing some blades and giving me a little training. Down in Fields Landing, um, we're assessing our abandoned boats. We've got quite an inventory down there. We have a number of abandoned boats and people that aren't performing on their payments. So we're looking at some uh, traditional ways and maybe some other aggressive ways about getting rid of these boats and also taking advantage of the grant that we have for some of the abandoned boats. And then we're consulting with our district engineer as to the stormwater industrial water disposal. You can see the dosing tanks that we have there. Uh, we took water samples, our water's clean. We should be able to discharge it. And then we're increasing our uh, best management practices to make sure that we have uh, clean facilities down there and we don't have to uh, hopefully treat the water as we are currently. At RMT1, not a lot of activity presently, uh, but we're cooperating with the tenants that are in the power temporary situation. It's some good news. Uh, well, I didn't get it in writing, I got it verbally. It looks like we're about two weeks out from concluding that chapter in our history. So nice to put that behind us. And then uh, just periodically as needed, we're replacing some of the de deteriorated planks that are both on the dock and the gangway and trying to do our best to be prepared for our fishermen and crab season but not get too overly excited about uh, uh, doing much there until we know what the long-term vision is. And then finally at RMT2, um, we've been working on the uh, main pump house. This is uh, the pump for our 2 million gallon tank and uh, what we've got going on there in terms of water. Uh, we got that room cleaned, we painted the piping and some of the pumps, we per, uh, performed preventive maintenance both on our electric and our uh, diesel pump system there, which is our emergency pump. We began establishing preventive and recurring maintenance schedules. One of the nice things that uh, uh, my predecessor put a lot of great effort and maintenance into the project, 
Now we're getting into more of the preventive and recurring maintenance mode and less of the major infrastructure. So we're excited about that. And then uh, continuing to recycle some of the metals that are on site, keep our site clean. And finally, uh, again, we already hit on this, but we prep a space for the delivery of premises. That's all I have, thank you. District Council, you got anything? Yes, brief report. Um, the lawsuit that was brought by the Humboldt and Trinidad Fishermen's Associations against the district, alleging that the district was in violation of contractual and statutory duties to dredge, was dismissed by the court last week. This follows uh, the district's motion to dismiss on the grounds that the plaintiffs didn't state a claim as a matter of law. Um, I'm informed by the plaintiff's attorney that they intend to appeal the, the decision to the Court of Appeals. Um, they haven't yet done so, so I'll update you further if that occurs. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner reports. Commissioner Doss, take the service off. You bet. So, uh, Commissioner Coleman and I have been involved in some meetings with the uh, union, working on that, moving along smoothly I guess <laughs> um, it's smoothly. never never fast enough to to my liking but the grind of government pace is I'm getting used to um, next Wednesday that's gonna be the 28th uh, Commissioner Higgins and I are gonna be presenting at the Har um, Harbor Working Group luncheon so looking forward to that we're gonna be uh, topics gonna be dredging and uh, just excited as heck to see that dredging contract signed, and that's about all I got going on. County fair is rumbling away, so that's what I'm rolling in from today is the fair. Uh, well, like Larry mentioned, we have been meeting with the representatives from the union and uh, working on that process, uh, doing it very early in the morning, which is fun. But. Uh, and then I don't have much else to report other than uh, what seems like an interesting meeting I'm going to try and make it to on Monday evening uh, from PG&E. It's going to be at the Warfinger building. I think at 6 they're talking about the decommissioning and long-term options for the uh, nuclear material that's stored in King Salmon, which should interest all of us having that stuff been there for quite a while and I didn't realize too reading some of the background material that the King Salmon nuclear plant was the first nuclear plant commissioned in the United States oh, uh, 1955 the, yep and so I don't know what they're going to say because there's no place really to put that'll take it but uh, it might be interesting mm -hmm. to hear what's going on with it same story different day yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Marks well, living out on the fence, love driving across the bridge. I'm always interested to see how many people are out there fishing for halibut. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot these last couple of weeks, and so it's been pretty interesting to watch. Um, as far as uh, anything else that's going on, I'm just wrapping up softball season, and uh, yeah, <coughs> makes it a sad day for me. That's it. That's it. I am looking forward to the Harbor Working Group on August 28th uh, out at the small cookhouse. And I will uh, once again hold forth on the need for us to uh, arrive at a resolution for uh, coping with climate change, uh, maintaining uh, and improving the ecological health of Humboldt Bay uh, while protecting eelgrass and longfin smelt. And I think we could do so in a logical way that better serves the community and the species in question. And so if you want to know more, come on out and I'll talk all about it and answer questions. And um, this is going to be a recurring theme with me because I'm really happy that we're going to get the dredging done. And I'm so glad it's working so that we can do something. But we need to move to the next phase. And it seems to me that every time we uh, kind of anticipate success, uh, we have not arrived at success in terms of accommodation from the agencies on eelgrass and long and smell. So I look forward to that and I will continue to, um, I don't want to say harp, but uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm not happy and I'm going to stay on it. Uh, I, I finished getting water temperature gauges uh, out in the Eel River, 102 this year. 
was out with the Round Valley Indian Tribe on the Middle Fork. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, they had fun. We found trout where they shouldn't be. And it's an extraordinarily wet year and still have found. Uh, the Pike Meadow Dives, fourth annual Pike Meadow Dives, down by half. The high water in February of 2019 must have blown them out of the system, or at least well downstream. And that's good news, because that's, uh, that's the direction we want to see Pike Meadow go. And I've got a permit pending with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to go spear them uh, with people who are more adept at that than I, and stay tuned. And then if that doesn't happen, then Ted's going to help me make that happen. Because <laughs> we've got to go get those Pike Meadows. Uh, and I was out on the fishy business today. And if you think I'm embarrassed, no, I'm sunburned. And uh, the uh, halibut fishing outside was a uh, slow pick. I missed a hit. Uh, but we did, we got limits of California's inside. And it was a, you know, first, being in the fog out there, it's like you're in a sensory deprivation tank. You're in the fog. It's just like, it's all gray. There's nothing to see. It's all gauzy. And then when it lifts, it's really magical. And the, and the lighting on the on the bay today, and the, and the shorebirds. I mean, just a, the whole scenic backdrop, uh, plus some of the finest fish to eat on the planet. So uh, thank you for feeding me enough line to do that, Greg. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> Sounds like fun to me. Yeah, let me know when you're, if you, that permit comes through and you go out there spearing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, not yeah. Yeah, not that it. I've ever speared a pike minnow on the eel, but I might be able to help. I will, I will look forward <laughs> to the pictures. Um, so, Husky football started this week. We're in Santa Rosa tonight, the JV's playing. Um, tomorrow night they play uh, uh, in Santa Rosa again, the varsity plays. Who do they play? Cardinal Newman. Cardinal Newman, yeah. yes, should be a good game. Yeah. And then, like Larry said, the fair is going on full bore right now. So if you guys have a, have a desire, get down to the fair, support your local children with their animal projects. They'll be on sale on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, you got any tips on the races? I, <laughs> yeah. Don't don't listen to me. Yeah. You know what? Uh, there was a fundraiser for the fair this year, and uh, there's a group. Uh, the there's a group of. Um, sponsors at the fair, the, the fair presented an uh, opportunity to buy a racehorse. So there is about 400 of us that uh, all went in and bought a horse, uh, basically a donation to the fair. Um, the fair's, fair bought a horse named Pro Peppy, and she's going to run on Friday in a claiming race. And uh, everything that she's won will be money to the fair and then a pro she'll probably get claimed at that race and that those funds will go to the fair also. So Friday, Pro Peppy, and I think it's the fifth race. I'd go all over. She, you know what, yeah, her first race out at Humboldt on, <laughs> what was the first day of racing? She, uh, she missed first place by two inches photo finish. Came, came from out of, out of the side. So race five on Friday. Yeah, Pro race Peppy. five, Pro okay. Peppy. Okay. <laughs> That's the hot tip. That's the hot tip. <laughs> there you go, that's it. We, we, uh, we have a, we have a. Can I tell just a couple of 15 second joke. There was a lady, Ida Cernich, and she was really good at betting at the track. And people ask her, they say, Ida, I didn't win. It's just like, what's your tip? And she goes, you should have bet on the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The one you bet on was the wrong one. Wrong one. All right, so we're going to unfinished business. Um, and our letter to the Corps of Engineers. Thank you for this, Larry. Um, you want to you wanna take it away? Sure. So basically, um, you know, I drafted this, this letter. Um, and for some reason, this just isn't working right. But anyway, uh, the Army Corps has been uh, in Humboldt Bay since 1881. That was the first time they came to the bay and they started dredging. And so they've been here for a long time. And they've been, uh, you know, a partner in the navigation of Humboldt Bay for, you know, forever, basically, uh, in modern time period. And so in the end, with what they have, they have sort of the greatest assets to the North Coast. And uh, for a lot of, of us, we sort of take what they do for granted. You know, they come here and they dredge. You know, they also have the jetty and they have all these other things. And without them, uh, and maintaining these assets, 
Um, you know, I looked in 1881, you know, it was 21 feet. You know, is the first project was to get the uh, entrance down to 21 feet is what uh, mm -hmm. it was. And, uh, you know, look where we're at <laughs> sort of today if we didn't have our relationship with the Army Corps of Engineers. And so, um, historically, kind of what we had uh, was fuel, wood, and pulp. And it was pretty much uh, split, third, one third each. 400,000 fuel, 400,000 wood chip, 400,000 pulp. Had about 1.2 million. Currently, we're doing just fuel and wood chips. And so we're at around 800,000 is where we're at because we lost the pulp. And so it's kind of has been the question, how do you replace that pulp? And so, you know, kind of what the letter uh, outlines is that we're, we want to be looked at like a re-emerging port. We're re-emerging. And so we're looking for these replacement for the pulp uh, exports that we were doing. And um, essentially kind of the numbers that we're looking at is about, you know, 100,000 uh, metric tons for wood pellets and another 400,000 or so for the wind energy. Um, and that's the combination would, with the wind energy, you know, for, um, you know, the fields landing boat yard, looking at two years within the boat, fields landing boat yard of uh, coming in. And then after that, shortly after that, the, then the offshore wind energy would come on board. And so looking at kind of that steady stream, and then we could be up to 1.3 um, in kind of the five year time period. And so as looking at in the future, what could we be? And this is why we need the Army Corps of Engineers to really consider us. And that's kind of one of the things, the re reoccurring themes that we were, have been talking about. This thing is... Uh, there it is. There it is. So, can you replace the batteries in this? Does need to be upside down? So then, uh, with the dredging, sort of the key thing is we reiterating that we're a port of refuge. In other words, if there's a ship or a boat that's offshore and it's really rough and they can't get in, we're really the only place between San Francisco and Coos Bay where they can come in. And so we are a port of refuge for uh, ships to come into bay. And then also the Fields Landing Boatyard, in particular with the smaller boats that are less than 150 tons, then uh, you know if they need to do emergency repairs, uh, we need the Fields Landing Channel you know, dredged for these reasons. The entrance channel, um, Last year they had programmed in $3 million for the inner channel. We need them to replace that inner channel and we need them to share the survey data with us at, as rapidly as we possibly can so we can get the information out and have the fishing community and the shipping community kind of uh, know what's going on out there. So with the Hoods expansion, they just had the public meeting with the EPA the other day. We support the expansion of the uh, hoods as well as the nearshore beneficial reuse placement. Um, we would like them to, with the nearshore beneficial reuse placement, to authorize, similar to what uh, the Coastal Commission approved in Santa Cruz, that they could do 10,000 cubic yards annually, not to exceed 550 cubic yards of silts and clay each year in the nearshore disposal area. And so that way it would really benefit uh, with the island. Um, the city of Eureka and the other people to be able to discharge uh, those amounts in the near shore area. And again, the Coastal Commission approved not to exceed those amounts in Santa Cruz, and we would like to get those approved uh, for the near shore as well. This one doesn't like it either. Maybe I just need to be patient. Yeah, turn it upside down. No, you need to push that button a lot. <laughs> that always makes it work better. Right? You've got to hit it. Okay. So then, um, let me see. I can just look at it by letter. Okay. So then there's a long term show like, what is our plan, you know, for the, the long term here? And uh, there was a study that was done, uh, you know, it's called the 905B5B study that they did, that they, there was about 10 different alternatives that they looked at of how could you try to not have as much sediment coming into the bay from the Eel River. And so that study was done previously, and they, uh, they said, hey, it's going to cost $3 million to do the next phase of the study, and we want the district to come up with $1.5 million. And so when they came up here with the Harbor Safety Committee and we met with them, we talked about, well, isn't there other alternatives? Can't you do a partial study 
or what is even the scope of work for this study, we'd like to get the ball rolling, but you, we can't just sit here and wait for the Harbor District to come up with 1.5 million before we do anything. Um, and so we discussed some other alternatives uh, for starting to do some, some steps and start to discuss the long-term plan without having to, you know, allocate 1.5 million of district money at this point in time. In the North and South Jetties, you know, reiterating that uh, basically the Army Corps of Engineers is currently in the environmental and the permitting stage this year, and that next year they're planning to do some repairs to the, uh, the North Jetty, and then the following year to do repairs to the South Jetty. Uh, when they came up and they did some analysis, the first thing that they discovered is that the jetties are in worse shape than they thought that they are in, and that they don't have enough money to do all the repairs that they need to do for the South Jetty, or for the North Jetty, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and so we really need to stay on them to get additional funds to do the full repairs of both the North and the South Jenny, because those are the primary infrastructure that we have for the whole thing. And that a, a number of people think because the jetties are in such bad shape, um, it's partially causing some additional shoaling to happen, uh, in particular because of the breaches that are in the North Jetty and causing the backwater around the Bowie Nine uh, area. Um, and so, with the funding work plan, in other words, how do we get our projects included in the work plan? We've had a lot of st uh, staff turnover at the Harbor District, and I'm the first one to admit I'm not an expert in uh, the Army Corps functions and how to get appropriations from the Army Corps of Engineers and these things. And so we'd like some of the technical assistance and some support, you know, of just training us and working with us. How do we uh, do this on a, for a limited small port like this? Um, and reach out as a government to governments and kind of help us to learn the process as a district. Um, and then finally, um, we asked them when they were up here to be uh, members and actively participate in the Harbor Safety Committee. Um, because um, with the Harbor Safety Committee, then they're actively hearing from the fishing community, the shipping community, the bar pilots, uh, the Coast Guard, the Sheriff's Department, Fish and Wildlife, and all the other members of the Harbor Safety Committee, um, they're hearing firsthand. And it's not, uh, they're all the way in San Francisco and they're disconnected from San Francisco. And so we really believe this is a, this is a, a, a method of how we can get them more engaged into Humboldt Bay. And it's one of the things that we talked about with some of the other ports, some of the strategies that they've used. How do you get this federal agency involved? And you, you get them involved in local working groups and committees and they can do that either in person or via conference call as some of the other committee members do. But we need to get them more engaged with what's going on in the Bay and then becoming active partners in solving our problems. Do they so, still have staff here? What's that? Does the Army Corps still have a staff person in Eureka? They do have a staff right directly across, uh, but they're not in the maritime uh, side. They're really in the permit regulatory side and they mainly deal with like the wetland delineations and. Uh, you know, kind of wetlands and other land-based projects and gravel operations and those kinds of uh, projects is really is what uh, the staff here is, is primarily geared up for. It's not that they don't do other things, but that's their primary role. Um, and so um, that's kind of the way that we framed this letter. And I apologize for just giving it to you uh, today. Um, I was struggling with it a little bit. What is the approach? And um, it just feel like, um, you know, it's part of, the issue that uh, we need to get back to um, the million to 1.2 million metric tons. I mean, that's the conversation that everybody that I've spoke to for a long time is in order to really get the long-term attention and the attention that we had before, um, these are the projects that the district is working on and the other partners in their community have been working with us on and that we need to tell the Army Corps of Engineers that we put out an RFP for um, the multi-purpose dock. We're actively working with RCEA and the other agencies to do the wind energy um, projects and that we're a re-emerging port and we need your help. So that's kind of is an overview of the letter that I dropped. Comments, what's your uh, Support this fully. Uh, yeah, same here. Uh, and I was just thinking, well, one one small 
comment in here or a question. Under the north and south bay entrance jetties, you write, uh, the jetty maintenance and repairs are not your department's responsibility. So that does not fall under the Army Corps' jurisdiction, the jetties? Um, no, the person that we're uh, sending this letter to is Jay Kimberger, and he's the uh, division chief that is primarily responsible for dredging. Uh, the jetties are under a different division within the Army Corps of Engineers, mm -hmm. so it, it's still within the Army Corps of Engineers, but it's not directly to him. Okay. And so what I'll probably do I'd is... I'd clarify that a little bit, because I, I got confused at it. I want to CC some other uh, people, and uh, so I'd be interested to know who you might want to CC on here, um, but I would definitely CC that division chief as well. And just make it clear that we're not in any way saying that the jetties are not the Army Corps' responsibilities. Mm -hmm. cool. And then, uh, I mean, I'd be interested what the uh, rest of the board thinks, but I wonder, because I, I think this is a great letter, if we uh, just float it around to really just everybody who has a stake in the bay around here and just get just a huge amount of signatures on it and send it in might be really powerful. Could, mm -hmm. You know, the counties, the cities, the development, People, private interests, the tribes, I think, you know, just about everyone would sign on to it, I hope, and I think that would really increase the impact to it if this were, you know, delivered with like 40 signatures on it. Or yeah, I would, uh, I think that's a great idea, don't get me wrong. I, I did get a call on Monday from, from Jay, he was asking me when, where this letter was. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to, you know. Yeah, that would, so that was the, the other part of the question, like how time sensitive. And, and, um, but we could do it even in both stages, like send it to him and then resend it to him with a lot more signatures or something similar. Or at a minimum, send them to the other uh, entities. Um, Definitely the command. Is it Peter still? Is he still the Peter Mull? Um, yeah. The, are you talking about the, the core commander? No, he's he's staff. He's staff. Okay. Um, I I forgot to say in my uh, so related to this is the essentially the the head of out of I think their Denver office. He's the person that's in charge of. Uh, all the appropriations for the, essentially the whole Western. He's going to come up here in September. Um, and so we're going to set up a meeting with him. I was in communication with them this week. And so we'll also, and so send this to the Corps, and then there'll be a, uh, my guess is probably a few people that will come up with him. And so we could have a meeting and then discuss this mm -hmm. in uh, um, September when he comes up here. If we he hasn't finalized the date yet. Offer them a free parking spot for a dredge. There you go. Yeah, they need, to, they need to store it someplace. Yeah. Commissioner Mark. I'm still a little bit disappointed that we're not more forceful about their uh, lack of, uh, well, I'm worried about the lack of communication we had this last dredging cycle where they didn't allow the bar pilots or anybody uh, for the soundings. And, you know, again, I, I can't overemphasize that. That cost the Harbor District and it cost uh, Green Diamond seven hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. We just seem to overlook it, and, and the, their excuse was flip it. Well, you know, we uh, we have procedures. No, we've never had this happen before. And so, what happened to the Army Corps procedures? I mean, obviously they have directives and they have rules and regulations and they have standard operating procedures. What changed? to allow them to not let us hmm. do that. And it cost us, you know, shipping. Good point. Right, right off the bat, it was pretty timely when he was there. Because mm -hmm. we had a, a chip ship that had to leave half empty. Mm -hmm. We can't keep having that happen. That was one of the only ships we've had this year. And of course, that gets up and down the coast, you know, about, uh, you know, what, we're, what kind of shape we're in here. And yeah, last year, before this, you know, we had you know, before this decimated uh, year, you know, we didn't have that bad of a shipping year. It wasn't great, but at least, you know, we were getting there. This last year, you know, we might as well not have had a port. It's been a bad year. Thank God we can pay the bills. Yeah. Maybe we are still paying the bills, aren't we? Right. Okay, good. But, I don't know, I, I, would, I, I would be really happy to get the money with it. So, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I'll take the hit on this one, Larry. So, um, I think, I think, 
uh, when Jay was here, he I mean, things have changed. Things he he was he was openly um, apologetic. Uh, was I think the the his plan is to to address some of these miscommunications. Doesn't help us for what happened in the past, but I think it will help us for what happens in the future. Um, I think he's working towards those those ends, um, and I, I think that's our. The one good thing that's come out of this is that I, I do believe that he will be uh, more attentive and uh, willing to work with us. I was just a little bit surprised at how uncomfortable he was even addressing that issue. Yes. So I, I think we need a little sugar at least. Uh, he came here. He sat down with us. He got beat up. Um, he pledge to work with us and to solve some of these issues. I think we need to give him some uh, benefit of the doubt at this point. Trust but verify? Well, we could then maybe like present it as a, and thank you that, you know, for your commitment to address this issue. I have a couple of, I have a couple of edits or comments on that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my point. Patrick? Well, you know, actually the implications of not stretching the inner reach have been lost on me. Synergy between those and our enterprise, Juliana Marina and the Eureka Marina, is substantial. And so I'm happy to see that that's in here. Uh, but I think that that's one of the reasons that our problems with the depths in here are, you know, are what they are, is because if there was active dredging in the federal channel between here and, you know, here in the Eureka Marina, then we would be a couple of feet lower. And so uh, it's, they need to get back on that and be routine about it. And then that'll be the synergy we're looking for to really make these costs manageable. So uh, I'm in favor of the letter. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. So I, I got a couple a couple little um, edits questions. Um, certainly, I, I think, I like the letter, Larry. I like it a lot. I, I think. Um, one of the things you need to say in the opening um, is 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 to address what you what you did in the end. Uh, I think well, but I think in the very first paragraph you need to have something that is, we all recognize. You know, we as community, we're, we we thank you for coming. We recognize the the um, the communication failures. We all recognize the communication failures between the district community and the cores this past year and appreciate his efforts to improve them. We can give him some, some credit for that because he, I mean, he came up here and he took a bullet for the, for the core. Um, I, I think CC, there should be a fairly large CC list. I'm not sure that we want this letter to be the letter that has multiple signatures on it mm -hmm. um, just because of the time it would take. We want to get yeah, this letter I out. Get that. But I think, I think we could certainly uh, pass this letter around and get people to sign it and send it. Okay, mm -hmm. but I think we just need to sign it and send it as a as a board. Um, I also would like to see uh, in conclude uh, an in conclusion paragraph and line out the, all the specific asks that we want. I want I want direct uh, one two three four five six. I, I'd like to see something that there's no there's no questioning our specific ask because um, that's going to go to Congress as well. So, and I think Congressman Huffman should be CC'd on this. Um, his staff and, and the congressman have been um, incredible to, to, to help us get through these, you know, these years. Um, the other thing that I think is that that sheet that you you passed out last week that that Adam and I put together with the volumes and funding, where the where the volumes were taken from, the interreach, the the interest channel and then some funding mechanism. I, I still think that's valuable because it shows past dredging, uh, where it came from, how much it costs. Um, and, and, and the fact that there hasn't been any dredging in the inner reach, not on this side, not on the other side. And it needs to happen. So we can't just ignore that because the entrance is, it, we have to have the entrance open. But they can't just ignore these, these inner reach channels. And that's basically what they've done. Mm -hmm. um, and they haven't spent all of the funding. They've openly admitted that they have not spent the entire 
funding allocation. The Congress funds this project and then they don't spend it all. They need to see that in, in writing. If they produce the chart or they provide us with the information, that will help them to understand as well. Uh, not just them, but us. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see that in there and maybe maybe attach that that uh, that spreadsheet. I, I, I'm not sure how we want to do that, but um, I think that needs to be on there as well. Okay, and send away. I didn't. So I, I will expand the. I'm sorry, oh, oh, I was just—I was going to say when you asked me, I, I didn't realize we were talking edits. And the, the one point that I'd like to just throw in there is that it's imperative that Humboldt Bay is known throughout the world as a 12-month open bay, and that specifically is for that Asian market that's going to be looking for pellets, but as well as everything else. But th that's specifically for those that um, uh, Asian pellet market. 12 months. We've got to be open 12 months. All right, so we've, we've had our piece. Anybody from the audience care to comment on this item? And I, I forgot to mention this, but I put a bunch of copies of the letter over on the table before the meeting if anybody uh, didn't get a, a chance to see it. Thank you. So seeing no one, we will, uh, so do we need a motion for that? <coughs> no. Oh, no. I think we do. All right. Thanks, Larry. Okay. So how did, how did we leave this? Are you just going to make the edits and send it? Or? Yeah, I'm going to make, uh, get basically I'm going to beef up the, the front paragraph, uh, as Greg said, and then I'm going to, you know, beef up the part about the, uh, the, the surveys and the need to get the surveys and be more forceful uh, in that section, uh, the 12-month uh, port uh, that Larry had mentioned. Um, I'm going to add a couple of CCs on the bottom of it, which would be the volume calculations. And then I'm also gonna, since I'm doing it, exhibits that I'll go ahead and add some maps, so locations of inner channels, especially because we're gonna expand the CC to people that aren't as familiar with it. And then have a, either, I'll probably do an attachment that will be the specific ask, because this will be the letter, and then it will be kind of a, a one, two, three, kind of on the ask point. And then again, do an expanded list of the uh, CCs. Right. Volumes, volumes, and, and funding allocations as well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then will Greg sign it as well, or it'll be just signed from you? Um, you uh, I have it set up. You can sign it if you want. Um, and should it be from the board? No, I, I think Larry's signing it. Larry, 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 Larry's fine signing it. Yeah. All right. That gives um, us an opportunity to do that again as a group too. Yeah. A different letter. All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Um, Number 7A, Ocean Outfall Dive Inspection. So there's a, there's a lot of activity on uh, ocean outfall um, between the, uh, the, the town of Samoa Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, it's currently uh, the, the, there's construction that's happening in the town of Samoa right now as far as the project that Dan's working on. And that essentially his schedule is within 12 months is to have those housing units, uh, the building permits approved um, and, and ready for occupancy. So before he can get those ready for occupancy, he has to have the wastewater treatment plan. And the wastewater treatment plan has to discharge out the ocean outfall, right? And so um, there's a lot of activity associated with this ocean outfall right now. And then in addition, the Nordic Aqua Farms um, is about ready to get into the permit uh, stage. And the permit stage is, is really is applying for the coastal development permit for the ocean outfall, and then also the Water Quality Control Board. And, uh, and then we also had discussions with the State Lands Commission, uh, because we have a, the, the lease with the State Lands Commission, and our lease has a requirement that we do these inspections of the, and maintain the joints and these other things. And so um, at this point, I really don't believe, I'd, I'd love to push this off as long as I could because I don't want to spend the, the, the money, uh, but we absolutely have to have this uh, dive inspection. We've got so much riding on this ocean outfall. And, uh, and so it's the same company that we've done it for years. In my mind, they're giving us a good and, and fair price. Uh, the one thing that I have concerns about, and this is the, I'm not a diver myself, but uh, I've talked to lots of divers, is uh, if, you, uh, if you happen to pick time period and you got really bad weather and you can, you can get cost overruns, you can get delays. 
but if you go and you time it when it's just like glass, it could go like clockwork. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some uncertainties here. Anytime you deal with, you know, divers and being out in the ocean and, and operating in these kinds of conditions. And so uh, what happened last year, I wasn't here, uh, but Alan was here and also spoke to uh, Tim Petrusha about that as we use the dive boat and so as part of this, I'm sorry, not the dive boat, the fire boat. And so the fire, the Harbor District's fire boat would basically be uh, the, the platform that the divers would dive off of. Um, and then they also use the, the hoses, they, the divers take the hoses from the fire boat and they use it to clear off the joints and some of the other things, the pressures from the fire hose. And so they use that, and so that's why the fire boat is critical to be deployed uh, as part of this. Um, and then another component of this is that um, because we're uh, doing this inspection and gonna open these ports, um, they want us to do a deep a flush at the same time. And so we want to, I can't remember exactly how much water it is, but probably empty you know, one of the tanks and flush it through the outfall when they're opening up the ports in the out, uh, down in the ocean to help to clear these ports and make sure that uh, this is all in operation. And so um, it's, a, it's an important project for the district. It's a critical piece of infrastructure and that uh, even though budgets are tight, um, I recommend that we uh, award the contract to m and Diving and then authorize uh, us a 10% contingency um, just in case something uh, we, goes wrong and we need to have, spend additional funds. So moved. I'll second. A motion and a second. Uh, any comments from the board? And so they do this annually? Is that? Uh, the last time they did it, I believe, was in 2017. Okay. And they give us an inspection report and they also do a video. Uh, yeah, I remember yeah. seeing the video from it. Okay, so it was like uh, two years ago. I think it's, I think it's fine. Yeah. yeah, they've done it a number of times, and uh, they 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 haven't uh, they haven't really. I mean, they're they're professionals. They know when to do it, when not to do it. So they haven't had big problems with showing up, and the water's too rough. They they plan for it. They seem to be uh, pretty darn good at this type of stuff. He's been, they've been, we've been planning for September for some time because of the weather. Yeah. Any other comments? Seeing that, I'll take it to the audience. Any comments on inspection of the ocean outfall? Let's have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. So we'll move on to um, 7B, new business. Reading, reading uh, first reading of Amendment 7 to Ordinance 6, and estab uh, establishing procedures for the conduct of meetings, elections of officers, and the past suit for approval of ordinances and resolutions for the Humboldt Bay Harbor Recreation Conservation District. Right. So basically what the, uh, what, what the amendment would do is that uh, we're currently at uh, meeting on just the fourth Thursday of the month and we would be amending it to go on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month from January through October. And then essentially in November and December, we would only have a second meeting uh, of the month as regularly scheduled meeting because of San, uh, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas typically fall on those same, uh, same dates. And so what my recommendation is, and I'm being abundantly cautious of this, is that you know the agenda, uh, when I first drafted this and didn't have the time to speak with the attorney, uh, the agenda says uh, introduce the ordinance. I'm used to doing an introduction and then an adoption through a two meeting process. And so the agenda says to introduce it. It doesn't say to adopt. You know, my recommendation is that you just bring this back in September uh, to adopt. Um, and uh, then you just schedule two special meetings and you schedule one for the second meeting of September and one in the second meeting in October. And, uh, and then that second Thursday of September and October. And that way we just get into the cycle. Um, but uh, we didn't really, uh, I agendized it as introduce instead of adopt. I would defer to the attorney uh, on that. I, I think we should just be cautious myself. I agree, especially with an ordinance. We put it off to the next meeting for actual adoption. Did we actually change the ordinance to go to one meeting per month? 
You did, and that was ordinance number six. That was done, and I checked. It was like I believe it was in 2014. Oh, uh, was when uh, it was it was done. That president was in six pretty thorough. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so one of the things that I would, um, since we're going to bring this back, is that, you know, I looked at the um, kind of within this, the same section and when the Harvard District, you know, was first enacted this ordinance, it basically said, here's what uh, the agenda would look like, right? And so it was kind of a basic, you know, sort of headings. And then now it goes in and here's specifically what it says. It's really super specific. You know, it goes into everything from the notes and everything. So because this is in, in an ordinance, you know, we can't change uh, anything in those. And just as an example, initially when I first came here, I said to myself that, you know, look, I'd like to have my staff give their presentations first, and then I could just follow up on the end and then fill in the blanks when they go in. But because it's done by ordinance, then I have to give my report first. And it's, it's kind of like, why do we have so much detail on exactly every little thing that's in the ordinance? It was kind of is my question. And so if you're going to continue it, you know, I would like to come back and have a more streamlined, you know, agenda process that doesn't have every little detail of what we put in an agenda, you know, specified by ordinance. It's just too much detail for, for And that's unnecessary. In most public entities, you wouldn't see an actual copy of how the agenda order is going to be in the ordinance code. So I'd recommend to uh, just remove it. The Brown Act specifies what needs to be in the agenda. So I, I'm, I'm now fairly comfortable, and I haven't messed up on the agenda in several meetings. Uh, and now you're proposing to change <laughs> the agenda. <laughs> Change it every meeting, yeah. the order. <laughs> I, I have no problem with that. Okay. So that would, my recommendation would be to, uh, you know, basically we'll schedule this adoption for the meeting in September, and I'll come back with revisions to this section and the, uh, the meeting schedule that we described uh, previously, and then that you hold two special meetings, one... Uh, no special meetings, regular meetings. You, you one, one special meeting. Well, we're going to have a couple special meetings until this takes effect. On the second, is what, because what, what happens is, is that with an ordinance, is when you adopt it, it doesn't go into effect until um, I believe it's ten days after, or thirty days. Thirty days. Thirty days until after you adopt it, and so technically, this wouldn't go into effect until your November meeting. Um, and so, in other words, we couldn't have the second meeting until regular meetings until starting in November. So you're going to have a special meeting that's on the day of our, our regular meeting. What? Exactly. Let's we'll uh, get labeled. On different. our future day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we'll begin the practice earlier than. Okay. Than, yeah. All right. Good, Phil Kent. Yeah. Do I need to read this? Do I need to read this? Well, we're, I guess we're just tabling it because it's going to be a different ordinance and we're just going to adopt it. Okay. Where we're going to hmm. So it's informational. Yeah. We don't need a motion. Yeah. yeah, it says the call to order at 6 p.m. We were an hour late. <laughs> well, that, that's one thing that maybe we should have that discussion now is that if we don't have an executive closed session, that we go ahead in our regular meeting times at 6 p.m. I'm fine with that too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Okay. Any other comments? Any comments from the audience regarding Amendment Seven? Seeing none, we'll move on to. <laughs> yep. 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 Uh, Joan Romo, Eureka. So. Commissioner Markson, could you explain that last comment that you did, that if you don't have an executive session, the meeting will start at 6. So that means that it's going to be a variable then every time that we have to look to see if there's an executive session, to see if it's going to start at 6 or if it's going to start at 7. That we still, it's not going to be a consistent thing. It's going to be a very, is that correct? Is what let you're hearing? Let me tell you, I've been uh, uh, up here for 10 years. And there's been very few times that we haven't had an executive closed session. But I think that we, 
we should have that levity if that does happen and we don't have an executive closed session that we could start at 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. And that's still dealing with a variable that it's not going to be consistent. The meeting will start at 6 o'clock every, every time. Yeah. But if, but we can't, but then we have to sit around for an hour waiting for the regular session to start if you have an executive session. I apologize for that, but that, yes, that's accurate. Which I also believe is the way most city councils are under yeah. operate. Yeah, it's not on most. Okay. And with a special session, still according to the definition of a special session, it's supposed to only have one agenda item on it. Otherwise, they're regular sessions. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments? All right. Can you know, let's move on to eight. Administrative permit A218-02. Amendment number one, Woodland, Woodley Island Marina Maintenance Dredging. I move that we approve that item. <laughs> <laughs> You're faster than me. Second. These um, are already uh, up, approved. I'm, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, uh, I believe they're already approved. I already signed off on them because they're administrative permits. It doesn't take any action. Can, can, oh, I, can, I, just, can I just move that we approve item A and B both and just to confirm with our executive director, he's, yes. he's covered just in case. They're already approved and signed. Yeah, let's do it. And Ryan, right. do we need to do anything more? No. Good. So we, uh, so those are just administrative permits that we have, uh, we have adjudicated? Yes. Adjudicated is not the word probably, but yeah. thank you very much. Adjourn. But before we adjourn, did we schedule uh, Second meetings for the next two months is was that what we were going to do? Or? We haven't had that ordinance come up yet. We haven't had the ordinance, but we've so had the discussion. Have to make notice of the second Thursday. The first, well, we have the first Thursday or the second Thursday of next month. We'll have to have a special meeting. Second. If we want to have two meetings in September and two meetings in October, correct. And so, is that the board's desire to have two meetings in September and? Because I think we should then go ahead and announce it now so that the public can know that that's what we're planning. Because we've been talking about having two meetings. And if, if it's not necessarily for us having two meetings, so. <laughs> we're not, we're not voting on it. We're not voting on it. We already, we, already, we already went through that process. It's not on the agenda. So I'm not sure that we can, can we announce that we're, we're holding Special meetings. Or do we just, because you just first. schedule meetings. You can schedule them. Um, but if we're not, no, just, uh, not we in can, agreement that we're doing it. And we can, we, under the Brown Act, we can schedule a special meeting at any time. We if necessary. We're not required to, with proper notice. Right. Um, so we don't have to if we don't want to. Um, well, we want to, we, we're, we're going through this, the Hug and Pony show to, to start doing two meetings a month. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be more transparent when we're having the meetings and be, you be know, give us yeah. consistent and long enough. Well, if we just, can we just say, let's, let, let's stay tuned. We're going to get that announcement out as early as possible. If we, if we need that second meeting in September and really as a commission, we've solved a lot of the big issues at present, right? There's not, I mean, we've got not a lot of business is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're not going to have a lot of pressure on us to, but if something were to come up, we're, we're up there ready to do that. So and we, we have a scheduled meeting for the fourth, fourth, fourth Thursday. So, so should we just stick and wait till the ordinance comes back and then yeah. do it that way? Okay, I'm fine with that. Okay. But I'm thinking that we should all get together and have a barbecue the day that the dredge thing is going on out here. Oh, that's, yeah, I remember you were treating us all, right? Yeah, yeah. I think dogs around. <laughs> Horse. We got, a, we got a couple horses. Yeah. No. All right, so I have a motion to adjourn. Do you have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs>